Hello and welcome to the 168th episode of the Georgia Farm Bureau Georgia Prep Sports Drive for the GHSA state title. We are back. It's Halloween. I don't know if I look like a aristocrat, a prince, or Captain Crunch, but I'm in the spirit, so that's all that matters. Our three guests today, we're going to start things off with Najee, and then we got two very um, interesting coaches to talk to. Ace Charters head coach Keith Hatcher. The Griffins are doing outstanding this year. They're 8-1 and one heading into their f finale. They're lighting up the scoreboard with 48 points per game, and we've even got their wonderful helmet right here that is going to go up on the Mercedes-Benz Stadium helmet wall very shortly. They're a new team to the GHSA that we did not have when we originally put that wall up, I think, in 2017. And then Clark Central head coach Dave Perno. They've played a really tough schedule, but they've been coming on strong lately, so we'll see what uh, they're looking to do in this season finale against Winder Barrow. They're coming off a dramatic 28-27 uh, overtime win against Eastside, and then we're off this past week. But we are going to go ahead and get things started with Najee. Okay, we don't have him on yet. So Najee, of course, was at the Gainesville and – uh, North Forsyth game this past week, and he had probably the best halftime interview I've seen. He talked about how North Forsyth was aggressive. We saw that when uh, they actually deferred the points on a field goal where it was a rough in the kicker, and they were kind of struggling to that point. Um, offensively to punch it in, Gainesville came out hot, and they were able to turn that into a Logan Curry touchdown but then uh, Najee was asked, what does Gainesville need to do in the second half? And he said Darius Cannon was going to be that spark for them. And, man, did he make big play after big play. Najee absolutely called it. All right, Najee. So I was talking about kind of what your takeaways were from that uh, Gainesville game. Uh, you kind of predicted what they needed to do with Darius Cannon. And um, what did you think overall? I mean, North Forsyth looked good. They looked in control early, but then – I don't know if it's just the atmosphere or the exceptional ability of guys like Darius Cannon. Uh, they really ran away with that thing. Yeah, I think for North Forsyth, uh, they just couldn't get the ground game going. Only 50 yards rushing in that game. Um, I think that really made the difference. Obviously, they, they leaned on McBriar in that one, but they only had about 56 yards rushing as a team, 50 yards. So I think that made a difference. They couldn't get the ground attack going. When you're trying to seal a game and you're, and you're trying to end it, you got to be able to have a ground attack that can kind of end the game for you. I thought, so I thought they had to pass a lot more maybe than they wanted to. Uh, Wes Roberts played a great game, three touchdowns, and that one really threw the football well. I thought Zach Shirley set up big for them. But I think that was the difference offensively. And then for Gainesville, what made the difference was Stacey Hopkins, number 50. I thought he had a critical pass breakup there at the, towards the end of the game. It was four minutes left in the game. Third and eight, he got the PBU, gives the ball right back to that smoking hot offense that just scored. Next play, Darius Cannon makes a move on the defender, and he scores a touchdown, puts them up five with about four minutes to go. So I thought that was the difference. And their playmakers just started cooking, I thought. I thought their playmakers were cooking in the second half. Cannon, um, I think his name is Travion Watson, number 14. Um, Niam Cheeks, when he's able to get the ball in his hands, was very elusive, I thought, in that game. So I think that's what really made the difference. And obviously our defense, too, Zarion Harrison, had an interception I thought was big. Still um, was able to kind of prevent some momentum for that uh, North Forsyth bunch and prevented the TD in the red zone. So I thought that was big. He had some big pass breakers as well. So those are the three key players I thought played exceptional in that game. And then obviously Baxter Wright played good. Uh, I believe he had three touchdowns, phenomenal on the ground and throwing the football. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Zyron Harrison had that interception, wrestled, wrestled the ball away from Roberts – or sorry, from Curry – and then Gainesville actually, after that, was trailing 21-7. So I think uh, Rusty and Brandon were talking about North Forsyth really brought it to them physically. And um, they were questioning whether or not Gainesville's even been in that position this year where a team has come out and been able to establish themselves physically. Uh, but, yeah, I thought uh, Gainesville just sustained it. Uh, they were able to get that big run. And then talk about afterwards. Didn't they storm the field? They did. Yeah, they that's did. something you don't see every field. day. No, definitely not. They would storm the field. There's fans everywhere. Um, it's hard to get players. So, yeah, it was definitely a unique scene there in Gainesville on Friday night. Yeah, it was bedlam. That was absolutely wild. Uh, how many people do you think were there? I mean, it looked absolutely packed. Uh, it's probably about a good couple thousand. Yeah. And did you get yeah. to see that practice facility at all? 
No, I was unable to. Yeah. It was crazy. They were showing some of it on the broadcast. And then Brandon and Rusty mentioned that the Gainesville football players are fed three hot meals a day. That's something yeah, I've heard never that. heard at the high school level. I mean, they come in, they get a hot breakfast, they get a hot lunch, and then a hot meal at the end of the day. So, I mean, then we had Trace Atkins singing the national anthem. I mean, in terms of a high school game, that was quite epic. Uh, but what do you think just moving forward for Gainesville? I mean, that was a, a big win. You think they're uh, pretty much just going to ride that formula out? Um, I think they have the talent to be dangerous. Um, I think they have the quarterback. I think they got the, the on the outside. I think they have the defense in order to be successful. But when you come down to playing in late November and mid-November and you're trying to go to the state championship is obviously their goal, you cannot have 15 penalties and expect to win. Any team you play, like a Langston Hughes, an Alpharetta, any of those teams you play, you come there and play that kind of football, you're not going to win. And they have – I heard from an assist on the sideline, I think – somebody that works indirectly with the team or directly with the team, said they average around 100 yards a game in penalties. That's not going to cut it in, in seven, 6A football and, and playing on the road and, and things like that. So do they have the talent to do it? For sure. They are a very talented team, very good bunch. But you keep shooting yourselves in the foot like that, I don't think you're going to be able to beat the upper echelon elite teams. Yep, absolutely. Gainesville, a ton of false start and procedure penalties. Uh, great take. And I actually want to use that point to go into the – We'll talk about a lot of Gwinnett teams, but Parkview and Brookwood, I looked it up. Parkview had 168 penalty yards in that game. And so you see them early having to settle for field goals. I think that's what happened right there. It's like you have a great drive going, you get the false start, you get backed up, and then you have to settle for field goals. And then Brookwood kind of came out fast. Bryce Dobson had the first touchdown, and that was just a massive win for Brookwood. And then... What do you think about Parkview, though? I mean, these back-to-back -back losses to Newton, uh, to a rival like Brookwood, and now uh, they're going to have to close it out. Yeah, they're in must-win territory, I think, for Parkview. They was my sleeper I picked earlier in the season. I just love the way they ran the football with Kyrie Spain, the junior running back. I like that they're playing back on the outside of Mike Matthews and Colin Hulk Dorn in the football. I thought they were very physical and dominant up front early in the season. I thought their defense played well. But lately, not so much. They gave up uh, 41 points in that last Lost, they gave up 20 points against uh, Newton. So um, I'm going to kind of put it out here. So, you know, obviously they have the uh, – they can play Grayson this week. They have the talents to contend with Grayson. But, you know, they got to establish the run, let that build up um, into the pass, and they need their defense to play a lot better. A loss to Grayson puts them at 2-3 and three in the region, and then they're depending upon Newton beating Archer in the final game of the season. That's not a guarantee. If Archer wins, it upsets Newton. It puts Newton, Parkview, and Archer in a three-way tie at 2-3 and three in the region. So – you know, you want to save yourself from not having to go, you know, through that. You want to kind of just go in there and handle your business. Now, will it be easy against Grayson? Of course not. They already wrapped up the region. They're looking to kind of be firing on all cylinders before they hit into kind of the playoffs. So they got to do what they got to do. And like I said, establish the ground attack, hit your playmakers on the outside. I think they'll be fine. But defensively, they got to play a lot better. Uh, their defensive front got to play better. And I think they'll be just fine. Yep. And, um, I, I saw also uh, Dylan Lonergan, apparently, Coach Phil Jones said after the, the game that he was battling the flu all week. So he had a good performance. And then Brookwood also had a defensive touchdown in that game. So, yeah, Parkview has been sloppy. Uh, we know Grayson's going to want to continue to play play well. They aren't going to come out just because they have the region secured. They're trying to build for a playoff run. So I think Parkview Grayson, one of the big games in Gwinnett this week, um, Obviously, uh, Buford, they're already secured at number one, uh, the number one seed as well. But the other game I'm interested in Gwinnett this week is going to be that North Gwinnett and Norcross one. I think that is a very interesting matchup. Both those teams have um, – I don't even know – they've played their best football necessarily, but they, there's a ton of potential for both those teams, I think, uh, offensively and defensively. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, for this game, this is a game going to be on GPB. Um, so, allowing the line for both teams, you got a region championship, kind of that number one seed, that um, home by game, of course, and, you know, playing kind of the, you know, the lower seed as uh, time goes on. But, you know, I looked for Norcross to pack their stadium in this one. Norcross right now, they're 0 2 on TV so far this season. They lost to Brookwood on PSU TV and a Corky Kell, and then they lost to Mill Creek on uh, ESPN, too. So, I want to highlight AJ Watkins. He's been having an exceptional 
um, time, intentional games in the last two games. He has nine touchdowns at 412 yards passing. So that is some very good winning football, 6 of 19 in his last game, only three incompletions. That is the kind of production you need from your quarterback position. Um, he's been able to spread the ball very well to Nakai Poole, Zion Taylor, and Lawson Lucky. So I think this will be a great game on both sides for North Gwinnett. They haven't been really asking their sophomore quarterback to do really too much. Um, in the last two games, he only has 25 passing attempts. They've really been uh, leaning on that ground game. Their last two games, they've had 417 yards rushing. That's an average of 208.5 yards per game. So they really haven't been asking Hall to do too much as the quarterback, kind of leaning on the rushing attack. And last game, Julian Walter, uh, Walters had 87 rushing yards and a touchdown. So I expect North Carolina to be trying to dominate and try to establish the rushing attack to let that kind of, you know, feed the offense and, you know, feed the playmakers, you know, down the field. And Marie Griley and some of the playmakers. You know, defense, you know, look for Grant Godfrey to have a good game trying to, you know, maybe blow up the box, but Norcross can kind of beat you passing too. So this will be a good test for them as they kind of ran through the region. And their two losses uh, this season has been to, you know, pretty good teams, Brookwood and Mill Creek, who's going to be in the postseason. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, North Gwinnett coming off a 45-8 win over Discovery. Norcross a 50-13 to win over Peachtree Ridge. Uh, you talked about North Gwinnett's quarterback, Ryan Hall, not having to do too much. And in that latest win, North Gwinnett had four different guys run for touchdowns. So they've been – doing it by committee. I think that's a really intriguing matchup. And then one more just point about uh, these Gwinnett teams. I think Mill Creek has responded really well since uh, that Grace, sorry, that Buford loss. Uh, they look outstanding. 45 nothing win over Decula. They're getting it done on special teams. Their defense is producing a ton of turnovers like we saw last season when they made that run. And then offensively, that balance continues to be there with Hayden Clark at quarterback. Brendan Jenkins, he just set the school record with his 18th uh, career touchdown catch. And then, of course, you have Caleb Downs able to do it uh, running and catching the ball. Yeah, they've been dominant. As you mentioned, 45-0 against Dekula, 54-0 against Collins Hill. That's how you kind of rebound after taking kind of a tough loss to Buford. You know, you want to talk about dominant, that's pretty dominant. They led 35-0 at halftime. Uh, Hayden Clark was 9 for 12, 93 yards and four passing touchdowns, pulled him at half. So they got all the talent in the world to compete. Mikhail Wood, another receiver, Brendan Jenkins, who is the son of Michael Jenkins, a former Atlanta Falcons receiver. Caleb Downs, they still have Ken Robinson in the backfield. So they have a multitude of ways they can beat you, a myriad of ways they can beat you. So I think for them, it's just going to be, you know, how they're going to keep, continue to, to respond to adversity. You're going to face some in playoff games. You might not have that first half start that you want, but how, how resilient is your bunch? You know, do they have any resolve? And I think they do. They showed in the last couple of games, and their defense has been firing on all cylinders, pitching two shutouts and defensive touchdowns. So they can keep that tie going. They might be able to kind of contend and play against who they're probably going to see in the postseason, which will be Buford. And, you know, that game they were competing, you know, they ultimately suffered a loss. But they played on big stages, Mill Creek has, and they, they played well. Yep, and one more 7A game that we're going to be looking forward to this week, uh, Milton and Lambert. I mean, how big is that one going to be? Can Lambert give Milton their first uh, region loss since 2017? Yeah, there's so many storylines in this game. Uh, this is actually going to be my game of the week, so I'll have that on scoreatl.com later on um, this week. Um, I'm excited for this one. Um, you know, Milton is seeking their fifth straight region title. They haven't had a region loss since 2017, as Craig alluded to. Lambert is 9-0. and they're seeking their first undefeated season in school history. Um, you know, Milton has two players that have combined for 14 and a half sacks, so they can really get after the quarterback, which I think will be huge in this game. Um, Milton has been leaning on senior running back Scott Maskowitz, who has stepped up pretty big, 553 yards rushing, nine touchdowns. Luke Nichols, sophomore quarterback, has stepped up too in a major way, so I think he does a good job of delivering the football, taking what the defense gives him. And then for Lambert, Again, not in no season, best start in school history. They are led by James Tyre, who's also their starting point guard on their basketball team. Does a great job of just not turning to the football and making sure they got those possessions and, and you know, they've taken care of it and making sure he's hitting those receivers. And then Brandon Jones has been a three-year starter for them. I think he's been great on the outside, 712 yards this season and eight touchdowns. So, curious to see what kind of a game, um, you know, he can have against that Milton secondary who's led by, you know, Bryce Thorne back there, that Florida commit. So, it'll be an interesting kind of chess match between both, um, you know, throwing the football for – uh, Milton, you know, kind of gets their secondary and then throwing the football for uh, Lambert. Yep, a huge region championship game. And we're going to have a ton of coverage all week long, so everyone needs to go obviously tune in when we air on the NFHS, but then we're going to have show clips on our score Atlanta YouTube page. You need to go there. Najee has great interviews, uh, great film breakdowns. You guys need to subscribe, help us out. The content there is outstanding. Once again, the score Atlanta YouTube page. But let's go to 6A because that's where our game 
uh, this week's going to reside in Roswell and Alpharetta. You mentioned how big Alpharetta is. Um, all their different receivers. You got a Roswell team that's been really stout defensively. I think that is going to be a great football game uh, with two teams that are really motivated to try to make some noise in 6A this postseason. Yep, this is definitely, I think, one of the best games in Georgia um, coming up this week. Roswell and their highly potent offense led by K.J. Hill stepped in huge first year as a starter, 1,573 yards passing, 22 TDs. Nikai Davenport, 1,170 yards and 12 touchdowns. So they can run and they can pass. So they're definitely very dangerous. They have, truly have a balanced attack. I think it'll be interesting to see how Alpharetta plays it. They can address if uh, Roswell has some early success in that game scoring touchdowns. You know, and then defensively, as you mentioned, in their five-game win streak, they have only allowed 6.6 .6 points per game. So can Roswell's defense impose their will again and shut down really explosive offense? Again, this Alpharetta offense has went off for 70 points in a game this season. So – you know, they're led by Ben Gunthrie, who um, head coach Jason Kerbin has kind of alluded to as he thinks he's one of the best passers in the state. Right now he's third in the state in passing yards, 2,624 yards through the air, 33 touchdowns and just five interceptions. Last game he had four touchdowns. Um, I mentioned last week too, they have four receivers with over 500 yards receiving on the season. That is unheard of in high school football. So Guthrie does a nice job of distributing the ball to all the playmakers. There's not anyone they don't trust to throw the ball with the game on the line, need to have a situation. And I think, too, the big key would be for Alpharetta not being one-dimensional. Uh, Coach mentioned they want to be kind of more consistent in the ground game. Last game they had 132 yards rushing. Can they continue to establish that rushing attack and kind of have that balance? If they can do that, they will be successful. Can they limit those turnovers? Can they deal with that early adversity that Roswell may kind of pitch at them? And then for Roswell, it's just rushing the football with Nakai Davenport and seeing if that defense can kind of hold up against that explosive offense. Yep, Najee will have that preview up later this week. You got to check it out. Um, other big games in 6A I'm interested in, uh, South Paulding and Douglas County. I think that's going to be a hard-fought game. I uh, really don't know what to expect in it. Douglas County could come out there and win big, or South uh, Paulding could show up. I think that's an interesting matchup right there. And then, of course, the uh, Thomas County Central against Northside Warner Robins. That's turned into a – region championship potential game right there after Thomas County Central's win over Lee County this week. And then just a quick note on uh, 5A, Cambridge is able to clinch their first ever region championship uh, this past week. I'm oh, sorry, uh, looks like we lost them. But yeah, Cambridge was one of the 39 teams that has clinched a region title already. Uh, Najee was very confident in them heading into that Kell matchup, he predicted that win. And when you look at 5A, you got a big matchup with Ware County and Coffee this week. That's a uh, number one Ware County versus number four Coffee, and then Cambridge is kind of sitting at that number five. And I, I really think that they can compete with anyone this year. They've got an outstanding, uh, motivated senior class. Uh, Najee always talks about how their offensive line was just begging uh, Coach Bennett to run the ball more. They like to get out of there, uh, kind of impose their will on the opponents. And then um, just some other big uh, developments in 5A, Northside Columbus. If you watched our show last week, we had their coach on, and they win their first ever region title. They faced McIntosh, and I think that was a 57-15 to 15 win. So not only did they clinch it, I mean, they did it in style. Uh, Decatur had a big win over Shambly to win their region title. Then you have Creekside in 5A playing really good. They're getting better and better. I think they're a team that can make serious noise, contend for that state title, and then you cannot count Jefferson out. They've been playing extremely tough. Sammy Brown has been coming on, and uh, their quarterback, Max Aldridge. So watch out for those. And then um, one game I want to mention just in 4A before we move on, just in this uh, kind of general preview of what's coming out this week, I think the best game in 4A is going to be Troop and LaGrange. Uh, that's a big rivalry game. They're going to be extremely motivated. And if you just go to Twitter and type in Teo Todd and watch any videos of him the last couple weeks, he might be the hardest player to tackle in the open field. I mean, he's so fast, one of the fastest players I've seen in the state this year, and also just tough. I mean, he's able to drop back. I always talk about how he can do, like, the jump passes too. But then even if he's bottled up or doesn't really have anywhere to go, he just has this elusive ability 
uh, to keep his legs moving and uh, escape and just make plays. And he led them to a big 50 to 15 win over Trinity Christian this past week. Trinity Christian is a team that's held Stars Mill scoreless. I mean, held all these outstanding offenses scoreless. And then for Teo and the Tigers to come out there and light it up like that, I think they're a serious contender in 4A along with Perry, uh, defending champ Benedictine, of course. Um, Cedar Town, they're ranked number one in, uh, in AJC's poll. They're number two in mine. And then my top team, North Oconee, who has been outstanding. And then a team that I also want to add in there, we had them on the show last week, is Stockbridge. I think they're very underrated this season. They clinched the region title, Region 5. They'll be wearing that number one seed into the postseason. So a lot going on there. And then in 3A, we're going to be watching for that Cedar Grove and Carver Atlanta season finale. That's going to be a good one. Uh, talk about battle tested. But we're going to take a quick break, though, and bring on our next guest. And thank our sponsors first, Georgia Farm Bureau. Our mission has always been to support Georgia farmers. That's why we created Georgia Farm Bureau Mutual Insurance Company, providing financial protection that farmers needed. While this remains the same today, we've grown to protect all Georgians through home, auto, and life insurance. From the very beginning and into the future, we stand for every Georgia community. We are our Farm Bureau. All right, welcome back. Poof. It came out of nowhere. Once again, we're celebrating Halloween here at Score Atlanta with the drive for the GHSA, GHSA state title heading into the final week of the regular season. And our next guest is going to be Ace Charter head coach Keith Hatcher. Coach Hatcher, how's it going? Going great, Craig. How about you? I'm doing well. I'm feeling in the, in the Halloween spirit right now. But I want to ask you about this Ace Charter program. Uh, what kind of attracted you to take this job? What do you see just in terms of the potential, um, just residing in this uh, class two-way, and then um, just the type of athletes you have at that school? Well, I, I'm from Macon. I grew up here in Macon, um, left for quite a few years, came back, uh, took a job at my alma mater about eight years ago. Um, and during that time, this school opened. Uh, the school's about seven years old now. And um, I just saw it, you know, they, they started to invest in athletics. The school was growing. It was an exciting uh, time for the school here in central Georgia. And um, they approached me about interest in the job. And, um, and, and it, I just saw the potential uh, that this place has uh, it's a great academic school, and, and they've really invested in athletics the past couple of years, and I was excited to be a part of that. Certainly. We have your helmet right here. It's going to go up on the Mercedes-Benz helmet wall shortly because, uh, yeah, you guys had just opened up uh, back when we were turning them in, I think, in 2016. So very exciting. And then just um, – so this is your first year, right? It is. I started yep. here in January. Okay, so you came from Mount DeSales, and uh, just talk about what you've seen this season just from the guys. I mean, it looks like uh, you guys have been playing with a lot of energy. There's tons of different playmakers involved, and then this recent run in the region has really set you guys up to have a special year. Yeah, you know, when I, when I first got here, I was able to assemble a, a great coaching staff, but we really didn't know what to expect from the kids. They didn't know what to expect from us, but uh, they've really trusted us, uh, given great effort. Uh, in everything that we've asked them to do. And, um, you know, we're just, we're just kind of on a roll, and we've played really well uh, over the last several weeks, particularly offensively. Um, and some of those guys that we've counted on to be big-time players have really done that uh, for us on Friday nights. Yeah, and uh, some of the guys we're going to get into only juniors. So I think the foundation is there. Uh, but – in terms of just overall roster size, what are you guys dealing with um, just as a program? We're at about 47 or 40, 48 um, right now, uh, but we're really excited about the future. Our, uh, our, our, seventh day, our middle school program had 40-plus kids in it uh, just in the two classes, so we're looking to grow over the next few years. That's awesome. 
And then, yeah, let's uh, walk through the schedule a little bit. It's a, a big region you guys find yourself in, Region 2, so you only had the three uh, non-region games. What's just your overall sense of that? Because, I mean, we've had some coaches on, they only have, like, three region opponents. They said it was a pain to schedule that. I mean, how do you feel just about the region you guys were placed in? I think we've got a good mix. You know, you like to go out and schedule a couple of games yourself. Uh, for different reasons, uh, some rivalry type games and some some games of interest in the area. But our um, our region's interesting with with the eight teams and and five of them here in Macon. So we've been able to kind of create some early rivalries uh, based on proximity. Uh, we've got the five schools here in Macon and three in Columbus, and uh, and there's a you know it's a tough region. We've uh, we've enjoyed um, renewing some some old rivalries that that have uh happened in the city of macon that, that we are now able to be a part of yep and we had uh, Northside warner robbins on the uh, sorry on the show last week after the big win over lee county he was just talking about the macon area all the great football and i mean i agree with him uh, you look at the depth of teams across all these classes uh central georgia that macon area can definitely compete with anyone so you are from that area. Just what's your overall sense about uh, middle Georgia football and what you've seen just in terms of uh, the standard continue to get higher and higher each year? Well, middle Georgia football has always been strong, particularly when you start to talk about Warner Robins and Northside. And, and uh, there's a great history in this area of, uh, of good football. And, you know, just being a new school, we're excited about being a part of that. Um, and we're really, you know, excited about, the level we've been able to compete at uh, this season, and, and we're hoping to continue to grow and and uh, and be even more competitive, and, and hopefully grow into a championship caliber program year in and year out. Uh, some of the schools around here have had had great success over the years, and we hope that we can be a part of that. Yep. And what was your first impression of your quarterback, Caleb Scarberry? Uh, just uh, he's a junior. Just how important his role was going to be, and just what you saw from him as a just the signal signal caller for you guys. Well, he has grown tremendously as a as a football player, and particularly with his football IQ. Um, saw a lot of potential in him based on the film that I saw of him last year. Uh, and when we first came here as a staff, he really invested in everything that we were trying to do. Um, he's he's made some big plays in the passing game, but he's also done some really good things. Uh, in the quarterback run game that have, have really allowed us to be more versatile on offense. Absolutely. So, yeah, he comes out in the first week against Crawford County, throws five touchdowns, uh, 256 yards. Then the next week against Georgia Military, I'm seeing he took seven carries, 114 yards, two touchdowns, also an efficient six of ten pass in that game. And then joining him is another class of 2024 guy, uh, your running back Aaron Davis, who – it's kind of a similar situation. He can make plays catching the ball, but also take those uh, 15 to 20 carries if you need them to. Yeah, Aaron's had a special season um, and really had not had a tremendous amount of success uh, prior to this season, but a lot of hard work in the off season, uh, really buying into understanding the system and what we're trying to do. And, and he's an explosive player, uh, runs really, really well. When he gets out in space, he's fun to watch. Yeah, and so I mentioned that Caleb had the five touchdowns that first week. You guys put up 70, so he had quite a good day as well. Uh, Aaron Davis did 16 carries, 208 yards, four touchdowns, and also caught a touchdown pass. So really strong out the gates. You guys had that win over Georgia Military after that, and then a 63-22 win over Petula Charter. What was kind of the message to the team at that point, Uh do you feel like they, you guys still had some areas to improve upon or just was it keeping them focused uh, just on a, kind of that one day at a time attitude? Yeah, we, we still have some areas to improve. Uh, we're just such a young football team and, and everything that we're doing is still kind of new um, to the team, but, but they've done a great job of embracing it. We've gotten better uh, each week and, uh, you know, we just try to focus on one week at a time. Um, these guys, we talk about it a lot, they have not been in a position where games at the end of this season are this significant. So um, 
you know, we're competing for a share of the region championship Friday night, um, and that's new around here. Uh, so we just try to maintain focus on on each day and getting better and, and playing at the level that we're capable of, uh, regardless of what's in front of us. Right. So I'm assuming uh, Spencer did beat Northeast earlier this year. They did, 14-13. Uh, okay. Spencer's a really good football team. Obviously, Northeast is – very established program who's had a lot of success in recent years. Uh, so, so we've got a pretty competitive battle at the top of the region. Yeah, I will get into that uh, Northeast game, but real quick in the Jordan game uh, to open the region, a name that I saw was a, a senior, Fernando Washington. Looked like he came a, made a pretty good impact. He had uh, two touchdowns offensively and a blocked punt in that game. Yeah, Fernando's another uh, special player. Um, he he was a late addition to our team and, and has made a significant impact, especially here in the second half of the season. Yeah, he had a massive performance against Rutland. I think uh, nine carries, 111 yards, two touchdowns, 12 tackles, two tackles for loss. He's been phenomenal. So you guys pick up the Jordan win and then uh, talk a little bit about that Northeast game. It looks like you guys – we're in it is really close and maybe just a, a bad third quarter and then uh their running back uh nick woodford that we've heard a lot about looks like he just had a really big game yeah nick nick's a special player uh we were really competitive early um it was really the first time that our guys have been a part of that type of atmosphere and that big of a football game and uh we were up 14 13 with a minute left in the half and uh, we just kind of ran out of gas. To, the, the running back wore us down there in the second half. But uh, we really left that game with a positive outlook. Uh, we talked a lot about we want to be where Northeast is and, and where they've been the last couple of years. And uh, the first half particularly of that game uh, gave our kids a good uh, vision of, of what they're capable of uh, because we were competitive and, and you know, hung right there with them. We just got to learn how to how to finish and be better in the second half, and we feel like we've done that uh, the last three or four games. Yep, so you you guys had the lead. You mentioned that they get a score before the half. I think it was probably like a 27, 28-point swing. Um, then the next week, though, I mean, 42 nothing over Kendrick. How important was that just to get back on track just at that midpoint of the season? Yeah, bouncing back was huge for us. And, you know, you never know how a young team will react uh, to a tough game like Northeast. Uh, but I was really proud of the guys, the way they practiced the following week and, and just maintained focus on, on moving forward. And, again, I think we were able to t take enough positive away from that Northeast game where our guys were encouraged um, to see what they're capable of. And, and we've really built on that over the last few games. Yeah, and then let's talk about your receivers, and uh, in particular, uh, Bryce Whitley and uh, Sam Whitley. They have been putting up some big performances. Yeah, two, uh, obviously, they're brothers, and uh, two of the most competitive guys that I've coached. Uh, great football players, uh, and those guys have really responded any time we've needed a big play uh, this season, and uh, they, they're, they're – uh, done a great job of working with Caleb, and uh, look forward to seeing those guys finish out out the season. But they are they're really good football players. They love to compete, and they've made a lot of big plays for us. Uh, and and hopefully we'll continue to do so as we get into the playoffs. Yep. So Sam is the senior. Bryce is the sophomore. Um, and then you have had I've I've seen just a bunch of freshmen even getting involved. I think uh, Gavin Beeman uh, defensively. So you guys aren't afraid to put those underclassmen out there. But I want to ask just from a program perspective, I mean, have some of your guys been starting to gather that uh, college attention that's going to just bring that to the program? Yeah, and that's, that's another, you know, that's new around here. Uh, but our guys are getting some attention. Um, and I think they're going to get more and more over the next couple of years, that junior class uh, is going to bring a lot of attention to some of these younger guys coming up through the program. And that's exciting uh, when they see college coaches popping in and out and uh, getting phone calls. And, and, you know, that's just that's something that hasn't happened around here. And we, we think that's going to continue. Um, and that's always exciting, particularly for a new program.
Absolutely. And then um, let's just talk about these last two wins. Uh, the Rutland one, 44-30, and then this past week, or sorry, yeah, it was this past week, uh, the 62-28 win over Southwest, just to put you guys in this position uh, to compete for a region title. Just what do you see just in these last two wins? Well, the Rutland game was, was much closer than the final score indicated. That was a great, great football game back and forth. They've got a, they've got a really good football team um, and, and really probably played their best game that I had seen against us. Um, but they've done a good job of, of growing that program, and, and we really had to answer late um, to pull away in that game. Really proud of our guys in that, that game. It was really competitive. And then last week against Southwest, we played the best first half we played all year. Uh, we're actually up 48 nothing at one point in the first half and, and really just executed at a high level in all three phases, uh, which was really exciting because we had not done that uh, up to this point in the season. Yeah, I think – did you guys have – what was it, three interceptions you guys had in that last win? Uh, yes, yeah, we had uh, we had three interceptions, one return for a touchdown. We had a punt return for a touchdown, uh, and played really well offensively. So it was a it was a great night. Outstanding. And so, what is the goal? Just this uh, final game to close out the season, another opportunity for your young team to be in a big environment. It is, and uh, Spencer has had a great season. Um, been able to watch a lot of their games on film over the last few days. Their win against Northeast was huge for their program, uh, and they put themselves in position to win the region championship uh, with a win Friday night. So we're, uh, we're going to go out there and compete. They, they've got some explosive players. Uh, they're really good defensively. Um, and we, uh, we're going to have to go out and play our best game uh, to have an opportunity to share the region title. Yep, and so obviously don't know kind of how things are going to unfold, but if you guys are able to pull this win off, do you know what that um, tiebreaker form format is? Okay, looks like we lost him. But yeah, I was just going to ask him. I think we had our other guest call in, but I was just going to ask him what the format is because sometimes it's literally a coin flip. Other times they have, well, they do – like a average point differential within the region. So um, in that case, that would be tough for them because they lost to Northeast 47 to 21, whereas Spencer, they had the one point win over Northeast. But still, I mean, the potential to have that three-way tie is there. And um, who knows what can happen in 2A. It's a very interesting classification. There's teams like Callaway, teams like South Atlanta, and then a lot of the private schools uh, from A private actually went up into 2A. So 2A looks dramatically different than it has in the past. And uh, Ace Charter has been able to come in this season and do a really good job. He mentioned his only loss was to Northeast. Again, they were leading early and then just uh, kind of had a lapse at the end of the half in the third quarter, but since then have been phenomenal and their offense is lighting it up. Okay, we got you back, Coach. I was just going to ask, uh, what is the tiebreaker format? Do you know for your region? Yeah, it, it goes to points allowed uh, in the common opponents that are tied to determine the top seed. Uh, from there, it goes to head to head. So, okay, so you guys are going to have to light up the scoreboard. There's a lot of scenarios that could happen Friday night. We're just we're just trying to focus on uh, – we're not talking a whole lot about that. We're trying to focus on, on going and playing our best game of the year. You bet. And then um, I was mentioning just kind of two-way as a whole. I think it's really interesting when you got teams like South Atlanta, Callaway. Um, some of the private schools have come in there. So, I mean, it's a – you guys know no matter what, you're going to be facing uh, some really talented teams later on. But just what's your sense of 2A this year? Well, I think it's it's really strong, uh, particularly Region 1, who we're matched up with, uh, with, with Fitzgerald uh, leading oh, yeah. the way. And uh, you got Worth and Cook and Berrien and, I mean, they're Dodge. I mean, it's just a really strong region top to bottom. But, you know, as you – Again, we just try to maintain focus on one week at a time, thinking about Spencer this week. But when you start thinking about some of those 
schools you're going to run up against in the postseason. It's 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 a tough road uh, to get the championship for sure. Absolutely. Well, Coach Hatcher, thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed it learning about this year's team, uh, the special year you guys have had, and this big opportunity to close it out against Spencer. So best of luck, Coach. Thank you, Craig. Appreciate you covering it. You bet. All right. Have a great day. Goes, Coach Hatcher. You too, Coach. Uh, we will be back, though, on the other side uh, after we take a quick break thanking our sponsor, Georgia Farm Bureau. Our mission has always been to support Georgia farmers. That's why we created Georgia Farm Bureau Mutual Insurance Company providing financial protection that farmers needed. While this remains the same today, we've grown to protect all Georgians through home, auto, and life insurance. From the very beginning and into the future, we stand for every Georgia community. We are a farm All right, welcome back. So we're going to go from the Griffins to the Gladiators and Clark Central and head coach David Perno. They've had a very interesting season. Listen to this non-region schedule they played. Cedar Shoals, Oconee County, Gainesville, and South Forsyth. So they got tested early. Um, had a kind of a rough start during that um, spell, but then once the region's come on uh they had a big win over east side that i mentioned two weeks ago in overtime and then they have a huge opportunity this week against winder Barrow because they currently find themselves at three and two in the region like east side is and obviously they have that tiebreaker over them so a big opportunity for sure but we're gonna go ahead we do not have them yet but so Loganville, as you guys know they actually started off the season undefeated until they ran into jefferson Jefferson had that massive win over them, though, and that's the one Sammy Brown had the six touchdowns. And so Jefferson is able to come away uh, in that one with the region. They're 7-2 and two heading into this final week, 5-0 uh, in the region. Log Loganville closed out the season last week, 9-1, uh, 5-1 and one, five and one overall. Uh, so they're looking at that two seed. And then, as I mentioned, East Side's at 3-2, and two, Clark Central's at 3-2. and two. And then Winder is at two and three, uh, so they would need this one. All right, Coach, how's it going? Good, doing well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, so I was just talking about this region. I mean, it's uh, pretty eventful heading to this final week. Uh, you guys have played a really challenging schedule. Just what do you expect uh, from Winder Barrow in this game and just uh, from you guys to close it out in this uh, key game? Well, for starters, uh, whoever made the schedule is not very smart. Uh, unfortunately, that's me. So uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we're getting healthy, starting to get some guys back, and uh, played well uh, last couple weeks. So um, hopefully, you know, you got to keep the momentum going in the playoffs. It's the right time to get hot and um, – Hopefully, we'll continue that momentum. Yeah, I mean, you did it last year, too, the opening against Buford and Oconee County, but then uh, kind of turn it on and getting some big wins in the region. So what was it like, though, uh, just in terms of the message, playing that really tough schedule, uh, Oconee County, Gainesville, South Forsyth, and then having to open up the region against Jefferson? Uh, just what do you see from your team just health-wise and uh, just – being in the midst of that kind well, of tough stretch? We've been uh, three, you know, we come in the last uh, three, four years and make it to the quarterfinals and just couldn't break through. So the message was from the get-go was we, we got we to gotta find a way to, to do a little more. And um, we felt like prior to this year that the region – was a little light. Um, and so we upgraded. And then obviously this year, the region got extremely difficult. It went from probably one of the lesser competitive regions in 5A to probably one of the better ones in 5A. So, uh, you know, all in all, we just kind of stayed the course. I mean, we, we knew we were going to experience some bumps and um, you know, actually, 
it could have been it could have been worse, but it it could have been a lot better. Uh, but nonetheless, um, you know, we've had a uh, injury at, at every position group this year, uh, and I'm not talking about a, you know a couple of weeks. I'm talking about we we've lost a guy at every position group except quarterback for for the season, and it, and that's probably really what has made it so difficult on us this year. So it's been a lot of moving guys around and, and teaching new positions and, and trying to piece things together. And we're finally a little more stable and have gotten a few guys back. So from our health standpoint, we're probably a lot closer than where we were about a month ago. So uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll continue to improve in in those areas where we've had to fill in guys and um, put some things together this week, this Friday. Absolutely. So yeah, your quarterback Lucian Anderson. You said he has been kind of the the main guy this year that has not had to miss any games, but he's had some injuries around him where he's had to kind of adapt uh, as as well as the coaching staff. But what have you just seen from him? just handling all these different opponents, uh, the outstanding defenses you guys have faced with the Jeffersons and Oconee Counties, um, Loganville. I mean, just to go out there week in and week out and give you guys a chance to win. Yeah, and he definitely has done that, especially this this second half of the season. And I think his, the early struggles came from a whole, you know, a lot, a lot of issues, but, but – Mainly, it was because we we're uh, young and inexperienced at receiver, and I think our our passing efficiency and you know the drops, the route running, all all the things you take for granted. We've been very talented in that area, for, even at tight end for the last three years. Uh, we've never had an issue there, but um, obviously this year it it stung us and it took some adjusting and. Um, but uh, thank goodness for, for Lucian has played well and he's given us a, a, another, with his running running ability, he's given us another threat. And now we're throwing the ball a little better. So I, I think offensively, and uh, you know, and we settled in with our, our uh, Mike linebacker at, at running back and uh, Kendrick Curry, and he's been a huge plus for us. I mean, he doesn't leave the field, uh, you know, pretty much the entire game, and he's handled that extremely well. Yep. Uh, he had a big game in, uh, out the gate, seven carries, 89 yards, a touchdown. Uh, sophomore Corey Watkins has been involved, Jadavian Atkins also. Uh, what about that Oconee County game, though? It ended up being a 33-9 to loss. Was that was I seeing it right? Just kind of a game where you the know, fumbles that, that, were contagious. A, the, the, no, that that that's an interesting deal. Um, you know, we opened up with Cedar, and there was an incident where Cedar had a, several guys leave the sidelines on a on a play, and there was some scuffling. Well, they they put it together, the officials, and then they. Dima, you know, they, they ended up kicking three of their players out and we got one unsportsmanlike conduct. Well, as the film matriculated around that week, I get a call Tuesday night suspending. They, they said we had five guys, you know, on our starting defense involved and in, in doing things. And I'm not saying that the ruling – wasn't accurate on that standpoint, but what I'm saying, the timing of it was atrocious. You yeah, know, that's you, interesting. everything's in by Tuesday evening after practice, and yet I got to pull, we got to find five starters for that Oconee game. And so, you know, on defense, and, and that, that's, you know, that, that really damaged us. And uh, not to make excuses, they got to, they got a good team, and I think Whit Weeks is one of the better players in the state. And, you know, I don't want to take anything away from them, but as far as our game plan and us being prepared for that game, we didn't have a chance from that standpoint. I mean, you, you take five starters off our defense, I mean, we're, we're just like everybody else. We're not very good on defense. 
when that yeah, happened. I mean, so that was, you know, a little misleading from that standpoint. But uh, nonetheless, um, I just felt like the, the timing of it was, you know, you have officials, they made a ruling and, and, you know, and I felt like we needed to move on. I mean, Cedar, I, I think they uh, suspended 15, 18 guys from Cedar. But unfortunately, we we lost some very important guys on our defense. And, um, you know, that had a lot to do with that Oconee score. Wow, that's crazy. I mean, how did your players take that, though? Because obviously uh, it's already the week. Uh, they probably didn't all think that some of them might get in trouble. But, I mean, how'd they take that just being told they can't play? Well, I mean, they were fine from that standpoint. We had to bring them in and we showed them the film. And, you know, a lot of it, I'm not saying, again, the ruling was – the timing of the ruling was, was what was – what was atrocious. The ruling might have been accurate, but at the same time, the majority of our guys involved in it, it was a self-defense thing. And, you know, from that standpoint, you're, you're way outnumbered. I mean, I think at one time, Cedar had about 30 guys on the field and we had 11. And so, you know, it's, it's a, a difficult scenario and, you know, and, but, but, you know, we paid the price for it, and, and it was tough on those kids. But, you know, at the same time, it was, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. You yeah. try and tell your kids, you know, don't throw punches and whatnot, regardless of the situation. And, again, it was a little unusual. I was proud of our guys. No one left the sidelines. And, you know, we kept our poise from that standpoint. But, obviously, the guys in the middle of it, there were a few that overreacted. Yeah, and so was that towards the end of that Cedar Shoals game, like out of frustration? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was the third quarter, you know. And so part of the thing is, you know, we paid a little bit of the price in the game from a standpoint because we couldn't play any any of those kids, you know, that were on the field during that play. So you know, I felt like we got dinged twice, uh, you know, with that standpoint. Interesting. So, yeah, that's a, a tough situation. You had five defensive guys out against Oconee County. You mentioned how good they are with Whit Weeks, their linebacking core, a uh, very experienced team. So that was tough. And then you played Gainesville next. I think their quarterback, Baxter Wright, is an outstanding playmaker. They're a tough team. And uh, that was probably another really uh, eye-opening matchup for you guys. Yeah, that was uh, that was the one game that I think um, you know uh, Lucian really struggled that game. That was uh, that was the one game that you know he had a tough tough time um, getting us getting us out of bad plays, and he tried to throw a ball away. It was intercepted. I think we went you know uh, nose to nose for about a quarter and a half, and really outplayed him and. Um, then we uh, had three turnovers in a row, uh, two interceptions and a, a, a fumble by uh, Lucian. And, you know, we were still in the game and, and we're going in before the half, I think it's 17-7 at the time. And we, we were out of timeouts and, and um, you know, we're on about 11 or 12 and we come up empty. Uh, we just got sacked on a play that we should have thrown it away and, and I think that was kind of the turning point. And they, they kind of dominated us the second half. But you're right, the, the quarterback's a tough kid, very competitive, um, makes a lot of plays. And, and the coach's son's a good, good yep. physical uh, player as well. And, and makes some, he made some catches uh, for them and made some plays. And they just got away from us early, but, uh, or early in the second half. And, you know, but since that point, you know, we, we, we've kind of been in, in every game. And um, I think that was a kind of the turning point for us from a standpoint that, uh, you know, we, we got to play a little different style. Uh, we needed to slow the ball down offensively and give our defense a better chance. And um, things have, have worked well. And, uh, you know, we really should have and really could have won that every other game at that point. But, 
you know, it took some growing. We needed to learn how to win. And, um, you know, there were some things we had to clean up. And hopefully, um, you know, we we found a way against East Side. And, and uh, that could catapult us to doing some good things in the in the playoffs. But because um, we, we could be a tough out. Uh, we've done, you know, things we've done well is, you know, we, we have – created turnover. I think we're about plus 10 in the turnover department. We've won the ball, I think, six out of our eight games. Um, and the other two, you know, I, th I think the only game we lost the ball was the Gainesville game. And, um, you know, and uh, since that point, though, like I said, uh, we're, we're doing things that it takes to be successful. We just needed a little bit of confidence, and hopefully that east side win gave us that because they're a good-looking – uh, ball club I can tell you that yes they are and uh, I think you said it right though since then you guys have been in every one of these games I do want to talk about the east side game though it looks like Jaden Kofer uh, your receiver you mentioned how you guys were young it looks like that might have been his breakout performance uh, 12 catches 157 yards two touchdowns so I mean how much did that mean for him just to have that big game yeah, it, it's huge for us, uh, and obviously him from a standpoint because it looks like we we we're getting our tight end involved, and now we got a go-to guy on the outside. And that, you know, I like our running game with uh, Curry and Anderson. So you know, if we if we can get one more receiver going offensively, and you know, and our protection improve, we we pretty much have gotten everyone back on the O line except one guy, and so. You know, because if, if we can give Lucian some time, he, he's starting to throw the ball extremely well, and, and uh, he's definitely a threat with his, his legs. So, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're excited. I mean, we, we feel better than we have all year. I mean, that, that's the, the key. Yeah. I mean, an overtime win, that's huge. You talk about all these kind of close losses, to, but to be in an overtime situation the first time this year, and getting that win. I, I do want to ask about the overtime period, but before that, it looks like in that East Side game, you had Galepsi, uh two forced fumbles, two fumble recoveries, and I think Jalen Stone had two blocked field goals in that game. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, he had an extra point. Okay. And I, I don't know if he hit the, the, the – he, yeah, he got pressure up the middle. Stone did. But, yeah, um, Bartez uh, – you know, uh, Gillespie, I mean, he, he made the hit. He put his helmet on the ball and, and boom, jumped on right right on top of them, both of them. Uh, he caused them and recovered them. And, um, you know, the, the huge plays for us, both of them were, and, and he's he's played extremely well. But, you know, he, he, he's not a, a tall kid. Uh, he's, a, you know, he, he's like 5'5". Five, five. And so he, he is, you know, has gotten – he has paid the price a little bit with some of these lengthy receivers that he goes against. They have gone up and made some plays against them. But uh, against East Side, he, he definitely held his own. They had a good-looking receiver on the outside. And um, he was able to – you know, he gave up one big play, but um, he made two tremendous plays for us that – kind of the second one kind of turned the, the game, really gave us a chance. And then in that East Side game, in the overtime, did you guys hold possession uh, second? Yeah, we went uh, we went second, and um, we were gassed. I, uh, you know, we it took a lot that fourth quarter for us to get back and tie it. And I knew, you know, I kind of was thinking uh, go for two, um, in the uh, regulation, but what had happened, you know, the, the touchdown we scored on, we had kind of got crossed and had the wrong personnel in. And, you know, and I'm kind of glad we didn't because it would have been a little chaotic. And then they, you know, I'm thinking there's still a minute 50 uh, left, but uh, they, they chose to, uh, use their timeouts on the extra point. And so they didn't have anything to work with. So I was glad when that happened because uh, uh, 
you know, they had enough time and, and they had a couple of timeouts, but they used them on the extra point to freeze us. And we ended up making it, tying it. And then uh, we went in the OT and we were able to win the toss. So we, we took it second and they, they scored and kicked the extra point. And, uh, you know, at that point we had time to make sure we knew what we wanted to run, you know, the, for the two point conversion. And, um, because we actually called timeout during regulation, and I wanted to see if if we could get our personnel and do it, and and we were able to talk about it at that point, and we're and we knew what we wanted to do, and so when we decided to kick, we knew that you know if we scored, we we were going to go for two, and try and win it right there, because I felt like we were out of gas. Yeah, and who had that uh, touchdown in the overtime? Uh, the touchdown, uh, I. I the touchdown was the ball in the corner to Kofer. Okay. And then he actually ran the two point conversion in on a reverse. Yep. So that was a memorable performance for him. And then, uh, yes. in terms of your special teams, though, is it Cooper Evans that kind of handles all those kicking duties? Yeah. He, um, we split the punting, but he, um, he, you know, he probably gets a little bit more than half the punts, but he does all the kicking for us. And, and you know, very talented, very good. Uh, but he, he has struggled this year a little bit um, with some mid-range to short uh, field goals that um, have, uh, you know, they've kind of hurt us. But a lot has been on us. We we haven't been great in the red zone, and, and we probably have settled for – a few too many field goals and that's something that we got to clean up going into the um, postseason because I mean you got we got to score touchdowns I mean our defense has a chance to be special and they can be really dominant at times but um, you know when you the east side game started like that I mean we start out with the ball on the 11 and uh, we end up a field goal and then we move it to the eight, and we had all that work, and we kind of controlled the whole first quarter, but it's six nothing. And, you know, they hit one play, and all of a sudden, fortunately, that's where Stone blocked the extra point. And uh, so we, we go in six six. Uh, but at the same time, if we convert, you know, those in the touchdowns, it's a little different ball game. And um, that's something that we've put some attention to last week and uh, we'll continue to do so because, you know, we'll have a tough time if, if, if we don't score touchdowns in the playoffs. Uh, we, we need to change all our field goal attempts to six points and make them extra point attempts. And I think we, we got a chance. You know, we could be very difficult to handle if, if we're not leaving points on, on the table. Because, like I said, our, our, our defense is, is very capable. Uh, they, they, they create havoc. Um, they create turnovers. And we've been very good against the run all year. Absolutely. But, yeah, you mentioned it, though, with uh, Kofer, then also getting the tight end involved. You got Kendrick Curry. You got Lucian Anderson, what he's able to do. So that would be a very um, advantageous thing to have going for you guys. But – uh, just in terms of this final game, uh, Winder Bear to close this thing out uh, ahead of the playoffs, where you've kind of been on this roller coaster, but then the records go out the window. Uh, what do you think, though, just overall of Class 5A this year? A lot of people have said it looks pretty wide open. I would tend to agree with that. You guys have faced a lot of the, the top teams uh, that yeah, many people consider. Yeah, no doubt. It, there, so. there, well, there's no, you know, Warner Robins. I mean, I know they're. They were good again, but they're not what they've been. Uh, we, we had the unfortunate pleasure of uh, playing them down there two years in a row in the quarters, and um, they're really good and loaded. Uh, you know, I, I think it is more open than it's been, probably. I, I mean, I think it's been very clear. You know, Warner Robins has been the best 5A team for about five, six years now. Now, they didn't always win it. But they were always there, and um, I think they it started back in it might have been 17 when Bainbridge kind of upset them. But you know Warner Robins was there, and then obviously I think they 
won it in um, 18 and 19, 20, and then, of course, they beat Calhoun last year. And, you know, a little bit on us, you know, we just didn't play well against Calhoun and I uh, tipped my hat to them. They came in here and beat us in a game that, uh, you know, we just, I don't know, just uh, locked up, I guess, just kind of choked a little bit. But, um, uh, you know, nonetheless, I I do think it's open. I, 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 unfortunately for us, if things go as planned, you know, first round's going to be Cartersville or, or Calhoun. Um, depending on what happens, you know, we, we still, uh, you know, we're, def we're not in right now. I mean, East side is in Loganville's in obviously Jefferson's in those three are in, you know, so we, we have to play well against Winder. Um, there's a scenario, one scenario that technically we could still lose if um, Jefferson beats East side and get in, but, you know, we we need to control our own, and we can get the three seed. And if if we win, handle our business and take you know do what we're capable of doing. Um, we'll, we should you know be the three, and uh, we'll be heading to Cartersville. And um, you know, it's good and bad. Obviously, we know how good Cartersville is, but at the same time, you go up there, and you know, when when you go in as a three seed, you got to expect. You're going to play someone good. And if you don't in the first round, you are in the second round. So, you know, one of the best, I, I, I believe, uh, you know, I know that Car Calhoun Cartersville game was a crazy game, but I still believe Cartersville's one of the best teams in 5A. Uh, I really do. So, you know, that would be a great opportunity for us. And uh, I don't know how we match up just yet, but um, I think we're capable of of doing some good things in the playoffs. And I know the message from the get go for our kids has been about the playoffs. And I, I probably, we might have jumped the gun, but when you go to the quarterfinals as much as we have the few years, you, you know, eventually you got to try and break through. And I uh, wish we, you know, we would have been a uh, one or a two seed in our region, but at the same time, Jefferson's very good. And Loganville and us had a great game, and um, I tip my hat to Loganville. Coach Smith's done a great job with them, and um, they got a good ball club. <clears throat> Absolutely. And, yeah, that Cartersville-Calhoun game, I remember Calhoun was up like 28-7, to and uh, some people were texting, and like, oh, this game's over. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> and they came right back. No, I, I think that was like three overtime. So you know they're a team that's going to be able to – just have that winning uh, attitude on the field no matter what situation they're down. So that would be a great matchup. And then, I mean, we were talking about 5A. Uh, Warner Robins, you said, I agree they haven't been um, as successful or dominant this season as those previous years. But then you got uh, teams like Cambridge that, I mean, they're playing really good football this year. So it will be interesting. Uh, certainly the playoffs are going to be stacked up. But, Coach Perno, uh, we really thank you for coming on, and uh, best of luck against Winder this week. That will be a big one. We will be watching it closely. I appreciate it, Craig. Thank you so much, man. You guys have a great day. You too. Go Gladiators. All right. So there you have it, guys. Uh, just a quick programming note. Um, Najee and I will be de debuting our show tomorrow. You can tune in. It's going to be outstanding. We'll be tweeting out the links, and we are going to be streaming every single day this week. It's that time of year, so we'll have another episode of The Drive for the Jiu-Jitsu State, State Title on Wednesday. We're going to have Roswell and Alpharetta on ahead of that epic matchup. And I'm really excited about that. We've had them both on kind of early in the year, but there has been a lot unfold since then, and they'll really be able to tell us what they think about uh, the other sideline, just uh, what kind of their game plan is going to be. The Najee Show, Keeping It Real with Najee Wilkins, will be on Thursday, and then we will close it out on Friday. Kind of in that bracketology mode, we're going to be with Jordan and Najee kind of looking at – uh, what the playoff picture is going to look like. We've not we've not done that yet. We have not uh, dived into that task, but there have been 39 region champions clinched so far. We're going to look at kind of what the 
big two seed, three seed matchups are, the potential tiebreakers, all that. So we'll start uh, getting into that probably Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday to be prepared for that. And then also you can go to scoretail.com. We got the softball state championships. Uh, the recaps are up right there. And then we have volleyball coming up. Uh, the state championships are this weekend and also the cross country. And uh, so we have all hands on deck. It is a busy week. Follow us at Score Atlanta's Twitter account. Go to scoretail.com and check out our YouTube page. We'll have all of it there. But we'll be back tomorrow and on Wednesday. Have a good one.